So we're back, and it is time for another one of our festival edition uh, videos. And um, just wanted to kind of return to that. So here's this first year. I'm kind of hoping that this might be a playlist that we just kind of riff on for maybe a few years as the holidays and the festivals kind of come and go. Um, and uh, and so this first year is kind of a real surfacey shallow kind of explanation of just what the holidays are, what they function, you know, how they function, the general, um, the, the general idea and experience that our family has with those festivals. That's kind of where we're just kind of keeping, I'm looking forward to like years to come because I have, I have, um, I have some cool ideas. I think maybe next year, see this year what I'm doing is I'm trying to release the video just a, a couple days, a few days before the festival hits so that people can be thinking on that and reflecting on that uh, as we approach the holiday and the festival. What I think I might do maybe next year is post my video just after the festival and maybe try to get some um, uh, maybe try to get some shots of my family at different points in the festival, uh, having different experiences, different parts of that. Um, those are those are maybe some thoughts. And, and then next year as well, I want to dive more into like. Maybe some of my favorite teachings that I've heard surrounding those festivals um, and, and kind of get into like maybe some of that, that Bema stuff that we all have come to know and love. Um, so that, that's, that's one of my thoughts. I also want to kind of double back. Uh, our festival edition dealt with, in a lot of ways, the spring festivals. And then, um, and now we're here, we kind of had a break because of summer and then you approach the fall festivals, and there's a new group. So the spring festivals, you, you do have Purim in there, and then you have the spring festivals. So Passover leading into the Festival of Unleavened Bread, um, and then you have uh, Shavuot, uh, which is uh, what many people call Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. Um, so you have uh, Passover, the Festival of Unleavened Bread. Passover is often called Pesach, so... Pesach, Passover, Unleavened Bread, Festival of Unleavened Bread, and then the Festival of Weeks. At the very beginning, we had Purim. And now we get to the Fall Festival. So you have what's called the High Holidays. So on either side of the High Holidays, they're bookended by two festivals. You have Rosh Hashanah. Whenever you look at it on paper, it looks like Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, but it often gets said Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. And then on the back end of that, you have Yom Kippur, which is literally the Day of Atonement, which looks a little bit different today than it did in, say, the Days of Jesus. But you have Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which are the bookends to what's called the High Holiday Season. And then shortly after the High Holidays, on a floating calendar, it's never the same amount of days every year, but on a floating calendar, somewhere right after the High Holidays, not very long after, you end up having what's called Sukkot, uh, which is really, it means tabernacles. A sukkah is a shelter. Sukkot is shelters. And so the festival of booths, the festival of shelters, the festival of tabernacles. And so again, you have Purim, the book of Esther. You have Pesach, Passover. You have the festival of unleavened bread. And you have the festival of weeks, Shavuot. And those are the spring festivals. You break for summer, and then you have the fall festivals grouped together. Festival of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah. You have uh, the fe uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And then you have the Festival of Tabernacles, Sukkot, as your fall festivals. So what I want to do today is I want to talk about Rosh Hashanah. Now before I get into that, I kind of want to double back. <clears throat> because when we were dealing with the spring festivals... I took the opportunity before we even got started to talk a lot about appropriation and supersessionism, and uh, not everybody necessarily agrees with that or liked my take on that, not on YouTube, not elsewhere in different places of my teaching. That's okay. Like, you need to know it's okay. I'm not the one that gets to say. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm no authority. I'm not the one that gets to tell you this about Messianic Judaism or that about Messianic Judaism or this about you have to do this or you can't do that. I'm simply offering some of my thoughts. If they're helpful, great. If they're not, reject them and move along. 
Um, but if there's something helpful there to consider, for me, I want to consider those things. I don't want to just, as a bunch of Christians, especially Gentile Christians, just run around and observing Judaism when my Jewish brothers and sisters say, we find that offensive, that matters to me. If my Jewish brothers and sisters say, that offends us and here's why. If my Jewish brothers and sisters say, we've seen history and we've watched Christians do this and this and this with these ideas, I want to consider that. I want to consider that A, because it matters, but B, because that's what I'm called to do. I'm, I'm called to die to myself. Uh, to consider others before myself, to take on Philippians 2, to take on the very nature of Christ, and to consider others before myself, others as more important. Like multiple passages, Paul calls us to do this. Obviously, Jesus called to love our neighbor as ourselves. So listening and having empathy and considering those things and asking good questions and thinking critically, it's all a part of this. Now, what I never wanted to insinuate is that if you're not Jewish by by ethnicity, by, by heritage, if you're not born into Judaism, that you 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 just you have to stand at a distance. Like you're not allowed to, you know, you're not allowed to play. Like you just kind of have to sit back and watch because this is for Jews but not for you. Now we 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 have this conversation where Ideally, I believe God's design in what we call the early church in that first century after Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, that first century, this Gentile movement was being adopted into a very Jewish context. Like, the Gentile believers were immersed in a Jewish community. So, of course, they would have been around Passover and Pesach. Of course, they would have observed Sukkot and the Festival of Tabernacles. Of course they would have been, they would have been invited into this space over and over again because they were a part of a lar the larger Jewish context was observing these festivals and they were being invited in and adopted in and included into this larger Jewish context. But now we have divorced these two worlds. We've severed this connection. And so now what ends up happening is you just have just a Jewish community, excuse me, just a Gentile community taking on this weird kind of semi-Jewish identity. That's what's, there's a dissonance there. That's what, um, there's a disconnect that we have to, and it's not easy. I don't know what the answer is. I'm not telling you what the answer is. I'm simply saying, let's be aware of that. There's a lot of nuances there. And let's figure out how, what's the relationship between these two. But even in, like, even in the worst case scenario, I don't know if even that's the right phrase to use, we as Christians who understand that our faith is deeply rooted in the Jewish faith, even we, Gentile Christians, I don't consider myself a Gentile Christian, but I consider myself a Jewish follower of Jesus. But Gentiles should be totally engaged in this learning. That's why I'm doing these YouTube videos. Because um, most of my audience is Gentile Christians. And we want to be learning. Like that's the whole reason that God partnered with the Jewish people. To bless all nations. To uh, be a light to the Gentiles. To hopefully the world and the pagan nations would see what God was like. So this, of course you're supposed to engage us. Please don't let me communicate that you're somehow supposed to be on the outside and just kind of watch. No, 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 no. Be fully in to learn from what these festivals are and what you can learn and how you can respectfully engage these spaces. And I don't know what that means for observance, but please engage the experience. Please lean into and, and on some level be educated, be changed, be transformed by the things that God can teach us through these festivals, okay? I, so I, I don't know if I doubled back well enough on that, but don't let me give you the wrong idea. I think it matters whether we offend our neighbors, especially our Jewish brothers and sisters. I think that matters. At the same time, our faith is rooted in theirs. We are grafted into their tree, Paul says in Romans. 
God did not plant a new tree with new Jesus seeds. God grafted Gentiles into a very Jewish tree. And so understanding that tree, learning from that tree, being grafted into that tree is a part of what we're doing here. So Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah, what is, what is that? Rosh, head, Hashanah, head of the year is what that literally means. It actually doesn't mean festival of trumpets. It's called the festival of trumpets, but the phrase Rosh Hashanah means head of the year. Rosh, head, Hashanah, lead of the year, head of the year, right? And so you mark this, this is also called the festival of trumpets because it's marked by the trumpets, by the shofar. So this is a shofar. It's a small one. Some of you maybe have seen those much larger, awesome looking shofars. They're quite a bit more expensive. I've never uh, gone to the work of purchasing one of those bigger ones. And they're hard to get home if you're in Israel uh, purchasing one. Um, obviously, I could get them anywhere. But nevertheless, uh, I have one of these small shofars. We always have a few of these lying around for Rosh Hashanah every year. And, um, and you, you blow the trumpet. Now, Rosh Hashanah is, in a lot of ways, kind of a two-day celebration. It's kind of the opening two days that lead into the high holidays. And on the first night, I'll tell you how our family, there's lots of different ways that I've seen it talked about and observed. I'll tell you how my family has done it because it speaks to us. And my kids, I can't wait. Maybe next year I can get my kids on camera. Um, my kids, this is, this is one of their favorite holidays. Um, this is one of the ones that they remember and they look forward to uh, more than any of them. They just love it. But we always have we always have fun blowing this, especially on the opening night. The opening night for us and our family is about fun. It's about celebration. It's about a festival. And so we have our shofar and we blow it, right? I don't know how that sounds on the video, but nevertheless, there's your shofar, right? Um, in, in traditional Jewish communities, you try to blow the shofar. There'll be a hundred uh, trumpet blasts during the high holidays. So, so, so you have your shofar and you blow it and you celebrate. One of the things that we do on the opening night, um, the festival of trumpets is also known as the Jewish New Year, the head of the year, Rosh Hashanah, right? Uh, Rosh Hashanah. It's the head of the year. It's the Jewish New Year. And so part of what you're doing on that opening night is we like to look back. So we look back on the last year and think about all the ways that God blessed us and we celebrate and we name those things. Kind of in the same way to what we also experience on, like, say, the, the more Western uh, celebration of Thanksgiving. There's a Thanksgiving element to Rosh Hashanah. That opening night, in fact, what we'll do is we take apples and we cut, we cut a couple apples, two or three apples into slices, and we have bowls of honey. And you take your apple slices and you dip it in honey. And one of the things that our family does is you can have an apple slice with honey and we all go around and we take our turns, but you can only have an apple slice with honey if you can think of something that you can celebrate and give thanks for. Something that you can bless God for in what he just did in the year, the last year. So if you can celebrate, if you can say, I'm thankful for family, I'm thankful for a new job, I'm thankful for new friends at a new school. That's going to be one of ours this year is we've moved to Cincinnati and we have a lot of new things that we're going to be thankful for this year. And, and so you dip that apple in and it's, just, it's a sweet celebration and you're blowing the trumpets and you're eating good food and you're drinking good drink and you're eating apples and honey and you're reflecting back. My kids, my kids love it. It's just a good, uh, it's a good wholesome family memory right and then you get to you know the sun goes down you sleep on Rosh Hashanah you wake up the next morning uh, it's not a mandatory Sabbath and so you might go to work you might choose to stay home I'm taking vacation this year so I'll be home um, and uh, and then eventually that kind of second night rolls around and again you have dinner only this time you think about another aspect to the sound of the trumpet. So the first night, it was all about fun. And it was all about um, remembering and memories. And it was all about celebration and thanksgiving. And then over the course of those 24 hours, you kind of start to remember that the trumpet has another meaning too. The trumpet also is the sound that you would hear when an incoming army was on its way. If you were about to be, um, if you were about to be attacked, 
one of the last things you'd hear before you realized you were under attack is you might hear the sound of a trumpet being blown. And so some of the rabbinical teaching, of which there is a lot of rabbinical teaching, by the way, some of the rabbinical teaching says, well, this sound of the trumpet reminds us that the judgment of God is on our doorstep. Because the next holiday, remember, this is the high holidays. And I told you that there were two bookends to the high holidays. On the one side, the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, the Festival of Trumpets. On the other side, Yom Kippur and the Day of Atonement, which we'll talk about in our next video. But you have this, you have the judgment of God coming. We're going to spend the next few days thinking about our sins and our transgressions and the state of our heart and the state of our relationships and what we've done to others. And we're going to reflect on that. And it's going to bring the sense of like the judgment of God. And so this trumpet kind of reminds you the first night, it was all about memories, celebration, thanksgiving, joy, fun. And then by the time 24 hours rolls around, now all of a sudden you're thinking about, oh, God was so good to me last year. I wonder if God will be good to me this year. And it causes you to reflect on, do I, should I, do I deserve that goodness? Who am I? Who do I want to be? Who is God calling me to be? And so these bookends to the high holidays, in between these bookends, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, sits what's called the Days of Awe. It's eight literal days. It's ten Jewish days. That's confusing. We can talk about that some other time. A Jewish day is anything that bridges... Like if you had, like sometimes when you think about Jesus being in the tomb for three days, if you've ever done the math, you're like, that doesn't work. Crucified on a Friday, raised on a Sunday, he wasn't even in the ground for two days, let alone three. But there are three Jewish days. Like all of Saturday, those 24 hours that form Saturday, if there's any of Friday and any of Sunday, that ends up becoming three Jewish days, right? It's three days. So on your days of awe, it's eight literal days, but there's a little bit of the first day and a little bit of the last day. So it ends up being 10 Jewish days. So you have the, ten, the, the days of awe that sit in between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And these days of awe, this days of reverence, days of reflection, there, there's 10 days, kind of in the same way you might think of like Lent. You know how in Lent we might fast from something and kind of spend those 40 days reflecting on our own transformation, sinfulness, the things we want to be redeemed from. Like in the same kind of way, the 10 days of awe are a chance for us to like think and reflect and step back and identify the things that God might invite us to change. Now there's more teaching on this that I can't wait to get to next year. But that's the... That's what's, that's what's happening on, on Rosh Hashanah. On the opening night, we look back. Apples and honey, good food, good drink. We celebrate. We thank God. We thank each other. We have a good time together. That next night, we get together. We eat, and we start to turn our attention towards, there's many things to celebrate. Let's make sure that we are right, that we're in the right kind of spiritual space as we head into the next year, because we will need God's forgiveness if we're going to make it into the next year. And so if this conversation kind of feels like it's hanging, it's supposed to, because the high holidays work together. They're, they're one package. So we've just talked about really part one, like the first half. And in the middle sits these 10 days of personal introspection, like personal reflection, confession, we're going to write down, we're actually going to make physical lists of things that we, want to, uh, that we want to do better and we want God to help help us get out of our lives. And all. we're going to, so in the middle is this, and on either end, and so if it feels like you're hanging, we're kind of hanging this question, this conversation right, we're leaving it right in the middle, it's because we are. It's because this conversation doesn't find its resolution until Yom Kippur which is where we'll pick up we'll, we'll pick up the next conversation kind of right in the middle and take it to its Yom Kippur conclusion. So that's where we'll pick up next time. Uh, hopefully it's been a fun conversation, some things to learn and think about uh, for now.
Thanks.